lot of union drama, <laughs> but um, I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping that uh, that I didn't set up too much union drama. But, and so yes, I didn't really learn to read properly until I was about eleven, and I couldn't um, spell my name either until that point. Um, mm-hmm. I am actually also dyspraxic. Um, which um, so I got the double whammy, working and quite hard, and 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 really really wanted to to go to Oxford or Cambridge, and I was a little bit obsessed about it, perhaps in an unhealthy way. Got to the interview stage and then wasn't given a. Place. I mean, it felt like the best moment of my life. I think at that point, um, because I'd wanted it for such a long time. I think in an unhealthy way. And I, I remember. Well. No, my mum started crying, and then I started crying. And I hope you don't mind, but um, I would love to just read out. The advice you gave me in your very first meeting. But can can we end? Can I ask you a uh, question? You, you are working very hard uh, the last couple of months doing an internship, um, and you're spending your free weekends when the weather is lovely and sunny outside interviewing. Why on earth are you doing it? Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my podcast, Coffee's on Me, David Kwan, where I strive to give guests legacy-worthy interviews that listeners can enjoy while cooking, commuting, relaxing, or walking their pets. Today, we're also recording in London, and while I am exhausted, my guest is enjoying a very, strong, a, a very strong espresso. If you have been enjoying the discussions on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts, please do consider leaving a review and nominating a guest by contacting me. Today's guest is someone who is very special to me and arguably has had the biggest impact on my time at university. Um, so far. Um, Freddie Fisk is a history graduate and former Cambridge Union president. He's currently training to be a solicitor in London. His interests include cycling, clumsily, he, he, he says, politics, architecture, cheese and wine, and getting excited about the Elizabeth line. Freddie, welcome to my podcast, Coffee on Me, David Kwan. Thank you very much, David, and um, thank you very much for the coffee. It's very nice. <laughs> All good, all good. I'm so happy that you, you, you're, you're, you're here and I'm very grateful that you've made the time. But Elizabeth Lyon, I mean, I'm not from London, but is there any special stories or any particular reason why you mentioned it? I just get uh, strangely excited about um, public transport. Um, I now create uh, journeys just to go on the Elizabeth Line. Um, I think as a non-Londoner, as someone that sort of lived just outside London... Um, coming to London and having transport, which I know Londoners feel is expensive, but compared to the train fares in the rest of the country, is ridiculously cheap. I just love being able to get from A to B really, really quickly. Um, and the Elizabeth Line is just so quick, so smooth. Were I love you, it. Were you on the Elizabeth Line today? I was, I was. It definitely wasn't because I was writing my bio on the Elizabeth Line that I decided <laughs> to put that in. So when, you, when you're on the tube, is it normal to strike up a conversation with people and have you just said hello and have anything come come about from it um i have occasionally i mean um funnily enough i think it tends to happen more with tourists so uh, if you know if i'm commuting to law school at you know 8 30 in the morning sadly i don't end up having that many conversations because everyone else is in their own um their own zone but uh i, I have a, a few tourists and i've learned you know wonderful things about the places that they've come to and their the, their kind of views of london and their experiences and people have their own extraordinary perceptions of London before they come here and then um, it's either completely corroborated or completely um, chucked in the bin and they think oh my gosh it's completely different to what I thought and so it's been nice to, to hear other people's views of, of London but generally they're generally they're tourists or uh, it normally starts because they're looking very confused on the district and circle line which is the one I use every day um, and I understand because I used to go around the circle line round and round and round and get very confused about where it was going so I sort of occasionally will interject and, and, um, and try and help Mm-hmm. Well, the reason why I ask is, um, to me, you've always been someone who's very open-minded and open to a conversation. You're enthusiastic to listen to others' perspectives. And I know when I first met you, I just, you know, messaged you out of the blue from LinkedIn and the fact that you took so much time to answer to a then stranger, I thought it said a lot about your character. And I was wondering, is that an attitude that you've always had where you're just open-minded and you're just trying to strike up conversations and see where things go? Well, that's very kind. Um, I mean, in some ways, I wish I, I felt more confident to strike up conversation in London because it's, it's often quite an isolating city as well because there are so many people and often they'll keep themselves to themselves. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I suppose I do feel I get a lot out of talking to people. Um, it's something I do all the time. I feel... Uh, 
if you were to ask me what my dream job it would be, apart, aside from being, being mayor of London, it would be being a professional conversationalist. Um, I just think we have so much to learn from other people. Um, and, and I think there's something about conversation that's very different to writing to people, you know, in a, in a, in a message on social media or whatever. You get, uh, it's a kind of deeper level of, of, uh, of understanding. And I, and I uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm always very happy to, to talk. When you think about great conversations, um, do you have a particular area that you particularly enjoy talking about? Gosh, um, I think I think everything. I mean, I do um, strangely love small talk, um, generally because it's it's uh, it's something that you do when you first meet someone. So I love meeting new people and hearing about their story and where they've come from. And some people hate small talk because it's something you feel you have to do as a part of a, like a general social convention. But I think there's something really nice when you meet someone else that you, you know, you ask them, you know, where are you from? What are you doing? Those sort of very simple questions are my favourite kind of questions. But in terms of general topics, sort of slightly deeper topics of conversation, um, yes, as you know, um, I will never shut up about politics. Um, <laughs> and I like talking about architecture as well. That's great. That's great. Um, do you want to give us like a quick maybe roadmap of where you have lived where you've been you know just so we have a kind of structural kind of skeleton and then we can maybe delve deeper into each of them but you know your your journey so far where are you from pretty uh yeah <laughs> sure um so i was born in scumthorpe uh which is a town in north lincolnshire um quite poor my father was a farmer um and so i was kind of slightly disconnected from that we lived in um, a very rural village with about, you know, 300 people. Um, and I lived there until I was seven. And then my parents split up. My mum needed to move to London for work to support two kids. So we moved to Woking, which is just outside London in Surrey. Um, and then I feel that that was kind of the place that I was, that shaped me most. Um, most of my memories, obviously, are post seven. Woking. Woking, yeah. yeah. Did you work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I it certainly opened my eyes being... Uh, slightly more connected to London. I mean, it's a more diverse, certainly a more diverse place than, than Lincolnshire. I'm not sure people in Woking would necessarily say that that's the first thing that comes mm -hmm. to their mind. Um, but yeah, it was, a great, it was a great experience. I'm very glad to have moved, actually. That's great. That's great. And when you said that your parents had split apart, does that mean that you were staying with your mum? Mm, mm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's often the case, isn't it, that kids will follow their mum. I feel closer to my mum. I think it was always kind of an understanding that that's where we would go, you mm. know. Mm. Um, so How old were you? I was, I was seven at this point. Um, I mean, I think I was aware that they were going to um, split up earlier. Uh, you know, I think, I think by the age mm. of six, it was clear that things weren't working, which in a way was good because expectations were managed. Um, mm. And as a, as a six or a seven-year-old, it becomes sort of strangely exciting because you're moving to a new place. And, um, I remember getting very excited about moving down south and the weather was better and we were by a park and we were mm -hmm. field. Yeah. So ready. starting school at the time, mm. what kind of school did you go to? Um, so I went, well, in Lincolnshire, I was at a local CD primary school um, state, quite small. It was very strange, actually, looking mm. back now, it feels very parochial. We had mm. basically years three to... Um, six which would have been anyone from the age of about what about kind of five to eleven mm -hmm. uh all in one class mm. um and they were about they were about three kids in my year so of course not big enough for a class mm. so and, and each year had about three kids in. so um yeah it was quite strange and then i moved to working and i went to a yeah. sort of like a state junior school but much bigger because working is a much bigger place mm -hmm. and i had a class of 30 kids and actually that was only half the year there was another class of 30 kids and that was quite a shock actually yeah um Lincolnshire is really interesting like everyone who I've met from Lincolnshire tells me oh there's no way you would meet anybody else from there but um three people who I live with in in college are from Lincolnshire and I feel like beyond London like Lincolnshire is like <laughs> everyone's from Lincolnshire <laughs> really that's very, that is that's not been my experience I mean I I am sometimes surprised that who I meet. I mean, it is, it is actually, I think, the largest county in, in England. Um, certainly not the most populous, but the largest in terms of geographical area. So it's not tiny. Um, it is a little bit obscure. And I think it also doesn't have much 
resonance in the public discourse. Nobody really kn- sort of mm-hmm. thinks about Lincolnshire much. Yeah. Um, my, funnily enough, my form tutor when I moved to secondary school in Woking was from Grimsby, which was the town um, kind of about 30 minute drive from where I was living. There were two towns. So there was Scunthorpe, 30 minutes in one direction and Grimsby, 30 minutes in the other direction in the car. And she was from Grimsby. And I just thought this was incredible that I'd met because mm-hmm. I don't think I had until that point met anybody in Woking from Lincolnshire. Mm-hmm. And then she was my form tutor from years seven to 11. Mm. Um, and we had a really great relationship, actually. That's great. That's great. Well, my 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 UK geography still needs a bit of working. I'm, I'm not really picturing in my head where all these places are. You know, the the, the stereotypes. It's okay. I've lived here 23 years, and I'm still not <laughs> sure. I <laughs> I can tell you um, where things are in Scotland. But I am interested in education, in particular, how you know our early experiences kind of shape us. You know, and, and you, as you mentioned, like you know, there are people who you build quite strong relationships with and I was just wondering like in primary school um what what were kind of your hobbies I know that you later on were quite interested in like drama for example Mm. but you know in those early years what were you like as a kid um so I I think at my school in Lincolnshire it was very um sociable in the sense that there really weren't many people in my class so you kind of had to get along with them so I used to enjoy playing games and we did kind of like drama role play kind of stuff and I remember at that age my friends have said later on oh you always used to lead the 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 activities which I wasn't aware of Mm. and then um, when I got to junior school I did a bit of drama you know there's a nativity play or something every every year which I was involved in but most kids were um Drama didn't come until a bit later, until secondary school. But I did, I do uh, remember being chairman of the school <laughs> council in year six. Wow. Well, <laughs> so you had the leadership potential quite early on. Uh, well, I, I, I certainly had the, the love of uh, meetings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I think talking to adults, I think I always, I was a bit, was a bit of a strange child in that mm. I felt slightly more comfortable talking to adults than I did to a lot of people in my year. And... That helped, I think, mm. with something like the school council, which is fundamentally mm. a relationship between students and mm. teachers. Were you voted or by, by staff and students or were you, were you just appointed after like two interviews? Do you know, I can't remember. Um, I had a feeling maybe it was a bit of both. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, at, at my primary school, um, it, they, they kind of make us write one of those like leadership letters, mm. like how you would demonstrate the school's values and then the students would vote and then the teachers would interview you so they make it seem like quite right. a big deal and then afterwards you have that like assembly where they give you all the badges and mm. for one year I think I was appointed a so-called a safe buddy um. and for a safe buddy every uh Every week you got to spend like two lunch times wearing like a yellow vest and just kind of walk around with the teachers and, you know, and I'm, then younger kids can come up and, oh, he, he kicked me or he said that. And you kind of had to be a mediator. I'm glad I'm not, I'm not the only one that um, was a complete swat at primary school. Mm-hmm. But um, I think those early leadership roles are quite fascinating mm. because obviously you're trying to be friends with your peers, but also, like you said, you are almost like mediating that relationship between students and teachers. Mm. And did you, um, how, how, how do, do, do you remember much of some of the instances that happened during your year kind of serving that role? I think it was the first time that I'd maybe had to think about a whole group of people holistically in the sense that when you're a kid at primary school, you have your friends, you think about, you know, hopefully you think about being nice to them, incorporating them, <clears throat> etc. Um, or, you know, the opposite if you're um, not. But uh, I think that was a strange experience because I suddenly had to think about people maybe who I didn't know so well in my classes or in classes below or other years, um, students that maybe struggled at school and etc. Mm. And so I think that was quite a useful experience. It was probably something that came to me only because the teacher said, well, you know, who do you know that's struggling? And mm. and I think that was quite, a, I guess, a formative experience to start to think mm. about the bigger picture a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And when you have thought about the students that were struggling, did you take action? Like, did you go up and maybe strike a conversation with them, ask them 
to eat food with you perhaps or did you maybe sit next to them to do homework with them or invite them for a sleepover I, mm. I don't know like what 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 did you actually do after you have those realizations i i don't remember everything in fact most of it i've forgotten because it was a long time ago mm. i do remember one thing because i um my mum made me write it down because she thought it was a good a good piece of experience that I could draw on in later life. Um, so here it is. Uh, mum, you were right. Um, <laughs> that were, at this primary school, um, quite a number of um, Muslim kids. Um, it, Woking's a relatively ethnically diverse place. It has the... Oh, I'm terribly sorry about that. It has the um, oldest mosque in the UK. Um, and so we had a couple of kids at primary school that... Uh, needed to leave on a Friday for Friday prayer and that created a couple of difficulties because technically they were supposed to be in school between certain hours um, and some didn't want to leave school for Friday prayer um, but it meant that then they had to give up on Friday prayer and, and that was a sacrifice that they had to make to be in school. So I um, discussed this with the school, this is something that some kids had raised with me and what we ended up setting up was a prayer room which was just a just a small space in school where um students could could go and pray um on a friday um and i i i, I was guess i was quite proud of that at the time because uh, it felt like i was making a little a little difference I mean, it was a very simple thing mm-hmm. that's awesome that's really cool and your mum is certainly correct in remembering that um but on that theme of struggling um, I believe that um, reading for you took a little longer than other students in your early years. Do you want to maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Um, yes, well remembered. Um, I was uh, dyslexic, I suppose I still am. It's something that um, mm. you have for life, I think. Um, and so, yes, I didn't really learn to read properly until I was about 11. It was kind of the end of mm. secondary school. Uh, sorry, primary school. And I couldn't... Um, spell my name either until that point uh, which was a bit frustrating um, because I used to be very excited about that what we had the free reader books which are the books that you get to once you've passed all the stages of compulsory books yeah. uh, did you have this in, in Australia or no but we had like a so-called premier's reading challenge that if you um, read 12 books you get like a bronze medal in the first year then silver medal then gold right. medal then yeah. champion and it was uh, such a big yeah. validation thing but it's a similar kind of concept i guess yeah yeah stages and yeah things. yeah and it's a good incentive system and i really wanted to be able to read my own books so i remember getting to year early year six so kind of i was maybe like 10 and i thought this is ridiculous i still can't master this mm-hmm. so i would get up um at six I had to walk to school. I don't know what time I left. It's probably mm. closer to eight, maybe half seven, get something. Up at six. Yeah, I would get up, or maybe it was six thirty. I would just make sure that I would read for half an hour. Just by yourself. Yeah, yeah. While wow. my mum was in the shower, um, and that's how I learnt to read. Um, so I think that's a useful experience. I think actually being dyslexic maybe gave me a better work ethic than I would have done, just because things were a little bit harder a little bit earlier on. Mm. Um, dyslexia is something that. Not a lot, of, a lot of people understand, but everyone hears it. And mm. do, do, do you want to maybe clarify, or do, have you noticed any misconceptions people have, or you know, maybe just for people who aren't that aware of what it actually means? Mm. I mean, dyslexia is basically, um, at its core, a problem with sequences. So that tends to involve either numbers or letters. Mm. Uh, sometimes dyslexics will struggle with both, but very often it's just one or the other. So for me... Um, it was a bit of both, but maybe predominantly letters. Um, so I was very able to talk. Um, in fact, I was pretty early um, mm. talker, um, and I sort of never really shut up uh, <laughs> since. <laughs> uh, but in terms of um, reading, it was very difficult because essentially um, sentences on a page are just a series of sequences of mm-hmm. abstract symbols, and that was very difficult. Mm. But I think people maybe think that it affects other things like memory and your ability to process information. And I guess there's maybe a, a general myth that it, it, sh- it will hold you back. I think that's, that's gone now, actually. I think there are a lot of great systems in place at school to help dyslexics. 
Mm. Um, but it's fundamentally, it doesn't really affect your IQ. It's just of course, your of ability course. to process numbers and letters. Um, mm. I am actually also dyspraxic, um, which, um, so I got the double whammy. And that affects um, things like hand-eye coordination and also processing speed. So I had the, 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 the kind of double issue of not really understanding the sequence of letters on a page and then also it taking quite a long time for meaning to sink in. Um, I wasn't diagnosed. My mum had, she was a psychologist and had, had kind of suspected that I was maybe dyslexic. Hmm. But at school, when I got to secondary school, if I was diagnosed, it meant that I would have been put in oh. a different set. Mm. And I wouldn't have been able to do two languages and et cetera. So she didn't really want me to be labelled in that way, which I think was a great decision. Mm. Um, but it meant I wasn't actually formally diagnosed until I got to Cambridge, aged 19, wow. 20. Mm. So correct me if I'm wrong, but in primary school, there was the academic side of you that struggled to read and you, you were clearly aware that this was something that you perhaps needed to work on or to conquer. I don't know if that's the right word, but... And then the other side of you is that you're a student leader. You are someone who's well respected by the staff, by your peers, and you, you, you are building that holistic understanding that there are people at different levels doing different things. How did you balance those two sides of you? Because I, you know, it, 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 the, these could be two totally different students, but yet you were both at the same time yeah it's interesting and no, normally I, I assume because you you presume often and mm. it's probably often the case that the more studious students and sometimes the brighter kids are also the ones that are Confidence involved extracurricular well, right? yeah, yeah and, and, and that's a very good point I think at primary school it didn't make so much of a difference because we didn't have sets academics I don't think people really have a strong sense of academics at primary school yeah you part of what you do is learning and reading but also there's a lot of fun stuff that kids do at mm. primary school which is just learning social skills yep. doing games and etc and i was always i was always very keen i was i was pretty i was pretty keen in, in most aspects but i think that helped i think the, the issues sort of came in more at secondary school yeah and i started then they started it was a really big secondary school mm. uh so it was it was just um it wasn't a sixth form, so it just went to GCSE age, which is mm. what they like, age 15, 16. Mm. And within that, we had, you know, maybe a um, 100 or so kids in each year, um, maybe slightly more. So they, they had a lot of sets, and, and I was in bottom set for most things. And that became difficult because you were with a mixture of people. Some people that uh, would, like me, just kind of, late developers struggle to kind of get things mm. as quickly as other kids. But you also got, sadly, kids that just didn't care. And that became difficult because I wanted to do, you know, extracurricular things like mm. the school council. And I had friends in, you know, who were maybe a, a bit more ambitious in mm. the upper sets. But at school, I felt like I was in a, with a group that maybe often were a little bit more disruptive. Um, mm -hmm. And I think maybe that not my competence initially going to secondary school. Mm. So waking up at six or six thirty to read, um, you know, you, you mentioned how that kind of shaped your work ethic. But did you make that decision yourself, or did mum, as a psychologist, kind of recommend you, or did teachers recommend you? Like at that age, waking up at six is. Uh, even for anyone now, like at uni, like waking up at six to, to improve and to learn, like that's quite. Yeah, gosh, I, I I couldn't do it now. I'm I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I feel very very lazy compared to my eleven year old self. <laughs> I think it was predominantly my decision. I was very lucky not to have a mum that really mm. pushed me academically, in a, in a, at least in a pressurized way. I think she was very keen to give me as many opportunities as possible. Mm. She, um, paid for me to have a a, a maths tutor on a uh, Sunday morning which was really useful. So I think she was always there and supportive. But at that age, I don't think she said, oh, God, you've got to wake up at six and do this. <laughs> um, I think I just basically realised mm. that I was going to leave primary school and not be able to read mm. unless I did something about it. Wow. Uh, and she was very supportive when I said, look, I should read more. I mean, perhaps she suggested, I don't know, perhaps she suggested, well, why don't you mm. try waking up early? But I, I, I remember being something that I did 
Mm. I set my own alarm. I got up. Mm. I did it every day. You're now obviously an adult, and you know. Uh, as I wouldn't. We grew I, w- up, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess as we grow up, we gain more perspective in life and kind of appreciate parenting and in a different way. And now that you're a bit older, and when you think about those younger experiences, what what do you think your mum? What 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 are kind of the values that she modelled and she tried to instil in you and your sister? I think my mum was a great mum, really. Um, she worked very hard, um, and I think, kind of by leading by example, she she encouraged us to to work hard. Mm. She sort of had to, I guess, as a single mum. Mm. Um, I mean, Surrey's not a particularly cheap place to live, so. Um, to you know, fund our existence, mm. she did have to work um, relatively long hours. Um, I think my mum is a great people person as well. So mm. I, I feel in, in many ways I'm quite similar to my mum mm. because uh, she was always very interested in us as kids and, and I think would always engage us with like her adult friends from a young age, which is maybe why I, I always felt very comfortable around adults. Yep. Um, but she would love to have people around and... Uh, would love to learn about people or learn about people at school you know my friends she might she might not have had time to to meet them yeah, and often yeah. I think she regretted maybe not having more time to meet my mm, you know, mm. the parents of friends at school mm. because she was working but she always was very interested in what was going on at school I think because you know of her psychology background she is very interested in mm. in people so I think I get I get that kind of love of conversation and learning about people and thinking about where they're coming from mm. I want to maybe move on to a bit about the mentoring, which is the tutoring side that you talked about. Mm. And I mean, you, for me, you have been such a great mentor for my time at the university, um, in the union, you know, giving me an opportunity, trusting me, guiding me, um, just being someone who I can always message and chat with. And that's why I think it's really fascinating for me to now hear about the people who did that for you. And maybe it started with the tutors that you had earlier on. And I remember a couple of weeks ago when we caught up, you were talking about there was that one mentor who you saw on a weekly basis. And yeah, I think mentorship and who who helped you a lot in your early years? Mm. Uh, I mean, firstly, I just want to say, you're always very, very generous. Uh, but um, it's always, a you know, I think... Uh, well over 50% you and, and, and how you make the most opportunities. But in terms of, uh, I guess, me and the people that have mentored me, I suppose because I had a mum that was work late, I would often stay at school and I guess I didn't see my dad that much. I mean, I had a good relationship with both my parents, but my dad lived in Lincolnshire, which is a four hour drive away. I suppose maybe I looked out for role models at school and whether I'd stay in school. This is talking about secondary school now. Um, I got involved in drama. I think some drama teachers were quite inspiring because they were very inclusive and free thinking and they tried to get anybody involved in drama. I mean, the, the problem with anything like drama or arts is, you know, you might get a bad teacher and they just want the the talented kids involved and they'll do a small group of productions and it'll be quite competitive and it'll feel quite cliquey. I was just really lucky to go to the school at the right time where there was a fantastic um, drama, actually two drama teachers or three drama teachers. Uh, um, I'm I'm going to do name shout outs. I'm sure they'll never listen to this, (laughs) but uh, Mr. Donson, Mr. Jolly and Miss Webb were all fantastic. And I got involved in drama relatively early on because I think they were just keen for lots of other uh, kids to to get involved and they put on massive productions i mean we had we had one production a year where there would be a cast of nearly 200 students in one play which was just incredible um and so i think uh, they they were role models um and then i also i was interested in the school council i think because it's something i did at primary school i think maybe at primary school it was a bit of an accident but at that point i got to time i got to secondary school it became something i was interested in and there were lots of um, teachers involved in that who were very interested in what the students were doing. So I think I got a good set of role models of people that were kind of, I guess, 
Um, it sounds kind of a bit wishy-washy, but fundamentally they were kind of givers, mm. sort of people that were interested in other people, wanted other people to get involved, feel invested in the school. And uh, that probably had a big impact on me. That's great. That's awesome. And I certainly resonate with the inclusivity of like extracurriculars and just really passionate, enthusiastic people, I think, gave at least me a lot of confidence when they go, well, you should do this. You'll be great at that. And sometimes I think kids just need that word of reinforcement and encouragement to take the step forward. I also remember, I think, in year nine, I watched Mrs. Doubtfire. Great um, film. <laughs> and after watching that film, I think I instantly became more sarcastic, for, for better or for worse. But did you have... Like, you were assimilating into British society, British <laughs> humour even then. Yeah, yeah, that was the beginning. <laughs> but um, did you have a particular moment, memory instance where the way you behaved or acted just changed? I think there are maybe a couple of moments. I mean, I think these things are a little bit more gradual. I don't remember one period of seismic shift. I think at secondary school, I remember there was a point maybe around about year nine, so I'm aged, I probably aged about 14 at that point. I had been kind of a bit nerdy, and I'd also been a kind of nerdy kid in a in classes where most people were not that interested in learning yep. um, or really struggled. And so I felt like a little bit of an outlier. And I had worked quite hard. And by that point, I was, I, I had sort of progressed into um, sets where they pushed you a little bit harder. I'd also done a lot of drama. And by that point, I think people basically began to appreciate quirkiness. Uh, and it's just, I think, a thing that, as kids get older they appreciate diversity more and being unique more whereas when you're a kind of young kid at secondary school mm. there's this real pressure to conform and I really didn't and I so I think that felt like a turning point because I felt suddenly I had um people had begun to respect me more and I think I gained in confidence at that point and was then began becoming much more willing to do many more things extracurricularly so I, I um, decided that I thought maybe... So I was involved in the school council in the sense that I was a form representative, which was, if you can imagine, everyone's part of a form. There were probably about 12 forms in a year. and then they... Is form a class? Form is... We had at school form in the morning and then in the afternoon. It oh, was okay. a registration. Okay. And our form tutor was our pastoral ah, tutor, basically. Yeah. Um, it was a very good system because you, you had someone that you saw regularly throughout the day mm. who was there not to push you academically but to make sure that you were doing okay mm. and as I said my form tutor was from Lincolnshire so we had quite a good relationship but as I, I represented that group of 30 kids um, and then I think by year nine I think maybe I became a little bit less of a the weird kid in the in <laughs> <laughs> not not really part of the main group of the class to uh, someone that had, uh, you know, maybe a wider group of friends. And I think maybe that encouraged me to then apply for more roles. So I then went from form representative, year representative. So I then went to the the main school council meetings where I would sit and I would say, mm. well, I'm talking about half of year nine here and this is what the mm. students that I've spoken to in year nine have said to me. And then beyond that, I did a few more plays and I was encouraged to mm. um, audition for lots of different roles. So that felt, it felt like a turning point in my life a little bit. Mm. And in terms of aspirations at that age, was drama perhaps something that you wanted to take professionally? Or, <clears throat> you know, did, did you have a think about what you wanted to do? I, I don't know, maybe you were planning your union campaign at the time. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, I, well, I, so uh, I think I'd always thought of drama as a hobby. I'd always thought it was useful for me to, to do well at school. I think that's something that my mum taught me, that, mm. you know, if you get good qualifications and then you get yourself yeah, a options. profession, yeah. you give yourself options and security in life. Yeah. Maybe that discouraged me from thinking about drama as a career part. I never really thought of it as something that I could go into. 
Mm. I still feel it's a very precarious profession and a great a great one and I admire lots of actors and I love it but I suppose I've always been reluctant to see it as anything more than something that I do for fun so what were the so so are you saying that you were just focused on doing well and see where the wind takes you Mm. because you weren't that focused on a particular direction yes I think that's true well I actually actually spent a long time wanting to be an architect um I used to, as a very small child, I used to build lots of things. And my mum would give me a series of books or blocks, and I used mm. to build strangely symmetrical Lego structures. Or... Um, this was kind of pre-Legos, and she, I, I was sort of age three, and she just gave me oh, some okay. books. I then got into very interested into Lego. And I think I wanted to be a builder age six, and then by the age of seven, I understood that the architect was the person that designed the, the buildings, <laughs> and I thought, no, that's more me. And then until... Really, until I got to sixth form, I was pretty set on being an architect. So that was, I suppose, if there was a career path, it was that. Secondary school slightly changed that because I was doing the school council stuff. Mm. I also got really interested in history. Mm. And I think I basically decided that I was interested in a wider range of things, which is probably why I ended up doing a history degree, because it's, Mm. I mean, it's a sort of a degree for people that like everything, I think. Mm. Um. When you finish sixth form, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you didn't get into Cambridge or didn't apply mm. for Cambridge initially, mm. did a year or didn't mm. finish your year at somewhere else and then you dropped out or you, you stopped and then... Yeah, so yeah. that that's probably the other big turning point in my yeah. pre-uni life. Um, I was, by the time I got to sixth form working quite hard and, and, and really, really wanted to, to go to Oxford or Cambridge. And I was a little bit obsessed about it, perhaps in an unhealthy way. Mm. And a lot of people told me when I didn't get into it. So I applied to Oxford and for history and mm. uh, got to the interview stage and then wasn't given a place. And a lot of people told me, well, you know, that's, you know, that's just, life. That's yeah. life. You know, it's a bit of luck. You'll you'll do great at any university mm. and th- including my mum in fact it was only really my aunt who um is a wonderful person um but has spent her life traveling around the world on a yacht she's a char- she sort of charters yachts um so it's very like disconnected from <laughs> uh university professional life and she said no you should go for it if you want it and I listened to her and so I I had a place at Exeter um I withdrew my place um literally like the day I was due to go up came out of the UCAS system so basically had no university to go to and decided I'd take a gap year um, which was a huge risk Mm. I didn't have the grades really for Cambridge either which was an added risk so I taught myself politics in that year to try and get the grades up then I got I was lucky I got a conditional offer Mm. um, from Cambridge um, depended on me getting an A star in politics, actually, wow. um, which I scraped <laughs> um, by, and I got there about two US marks. Um, so I think I, at that point I realised life was a little bit of luck, and also a little bit of if you want something, you've really got to, you know, go for it and try hard. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's a lot of lessons that can be drawn out of that, and certainly I think you would have learned a lot more about yourself there. I I, I just remember hearing that on I think our second call together while I was still in Australia and was at quite a ridiculous time and obviously for me not being able to start uni at Cambridge it was just not having that social experience feeling like I wasn't progressing whether mm. I've made the right decisions I remember first hearing that and it was such a reassurance that life doesn't have to be perfect all the time and you know, it is about how we adapt and mm. how resilient we are, how much we want to take the risk and just to grind it out. And I thought, yeah, I, I just distinctively remember mm. you sharing that and how much how much comfort mm. it provided me at the time. Um, but yeah, it, it, it would have been a risk to pull out the day before. Mm. Did, did you suspect that you were going to do that leading up or was that just, oh, I'm about to go off, but no, I don't actually want to go? I think I got increasingly closer to the time that I was 
due to pat my bags and leave and felt increasingly uncomfortable about it mm. to the point I just really didn't want to go. So I, I think I just thought, gosh, I can't do this. I just really am not happy mm. going, going here. And I feel I've not done, I've not done enough to, to, to try for the thing I wanted. So it was it was a gradual decision. I think it was difficult because everyone with kind of an ounce of sense told me not to do it because I I didn't get as good grades as I was predicted to get. So in a way, I was in a worse position applying mm-hmm. again to Oxbridge than I was when I had the predicted grades when I yeah. first applied. Um, but, you know, it's, I mean, it's, a, um, it's a trite thing to say, but we gain the most out of... Um, the sort of slightly precarious, difficult situations in life <laughs> um, when we're kind of up against the wall. And I feel that even if I hadn't got in, it was a great thing to have done, to take a gap year and to self-study and to mm. suddenly be in control of my life. Mm. And I, I learned to drive in that year. I did some work <laughs> experience. I then went to work back at my school. Mm. And all those experiences were really useful. Mm. And I felt for the first time like I was kind of mm. shaping my life a bit. So I really, yeah, I, I, mm. I look back and I think that was a very formative and useful experience. Yeah, well, you learnt to drive a car, but also drive your life, which is quite, <laughs> quite great. Very, very smoothly put. <laughs> very smoothly put. <clears throat> so, I mean, you had to self-study politics and the pressure was obviously quite high that you, you, you know, when you take a risk like that, it is a year of your life. And, you know, as you mentioned that you kept yourself busy by volunteering at your school, spending more time with family, etc. But did you have a structured, like, structured way of organising your days and weeks or was it just do whatever you feel like at the time? Because a year is a very long time, you know, in school, it's actually very easy because the routine's there, you got to get up, there are these lessons, there are these scheduled breaks, you go back and there's a few hours to do homework and you repeat again. Yeah. But suddenly when you lose that routine, how were you able to manage that? Mm. Well, I, I think, I suppose like the whole year in general, you sort of, I felt like I was learning from my mistakes. I spent the period, so I pulled out of university before I went in late September. I had a, a very short bit of work experience lined up with an MP in October or November okay. time. Um, no, <laughs> it was, uh, it was our local MP in, uh, actually Guildford. Um, and, uh, I was, a, I was a Lib Dem by that point and I felt slightly, slightly, um, embarrassed about going to work for a Conservative MP. Um, uh, she did, she did, she, she, she did lose the whip later on. So I, I like to think that she was a sort of liberal minded MP. Um, Anne Milton, she was, she was great. Actually. She was the Minister for Women and Apprenticeships and Skills. Um, and she was just one of those MPs that was loved in her constituency and really loved getting her head down and grappling with the day-to-day challenges of being a minister. Mm. She was never someone, I think, that ever aspired to be a really senior cabinet minister um, because she wasn't interested in the kind of politicking and the PR and all of that stuff. So I I actually respected her a lot. Um, Where was I going with the, the... I think we were talking about like how you structured kind of your year. Oh, yes, you that's right. Yeah. So I, I worked for um, Edmonton for a week mm-hmm. and that was the, the thing that was sort of next on the agenda. I de- decided I wanted to study um, government of politics, which is an A-level, because I was interested in politics and it made sense as a good uh, degree, uh, a good um, A-level to do. But I basically... I basically coaxed until about Christmas. Um, I did apply for a job at my sixth form, which I then got, which was managing a history project. Mm. But I remember getting to January and I had exams in May and I had basically done no work. And I got then the offer. I think also I had, maybe I was sort of thinking actually the Cambridge thing just wasn't going to happen. I didn't think the interview went that well. Then I got the offer and I needed to get an A-star. And so I then kind of really pulled my socks up and got quite (laughs) scared. And so then I started to create a structure to my life. And I did then make sure that I was up working by kind of 9, 9 
try to do a nine till five day, planned out the topics that I had to revise by when, and inevitably I never met the deadline. That's when I discovered the, uh, the what everyone calls it, Cambridge, the essay crisis, was I realised I hadn't met my deadline for, you know, finishing the kind of conservative ideology topic. So I'd, I'd then have to stay up, you know, late to, to do that and to meet my own deadline. But that was very useful because I think when then when I got to Cambridge, it, doing a history degree, there's a lot of self-studying. So it was it was useful, but it was also a little bit painful. Yeah, well, I mean, having gone through all of those pain, do you remember that moment when you got that A star and, you know, you had the offer and you, basically the first moment you knew that all that effort had paid off in the form of, mm. you know, you were confirmed twice. Mm. Do you remember? I moment? do. I mean, it felt like the best moment of my life, I think, at that <laughs> point. Um, because I'd wanted it for such a long time. I think in an unhealthy way, and I don't think Oxford is the be-all and end-all of life. Um, I, I'm really grateful of the time that I've had there. In some ways, I think it would have been healthier pre-Cambridge if I, you know, <laughs> had a slightly <laughs> a, a slightly more philosophical view of life. But I, the, it was fantastic. I remember um, crying, and then my wow. mum... No, my mum started crying, and then I started crying. And, <laughs> Because she, she greatly valued education and was someone actually who didn't have a, didn't go to a great school in, she grew up in Yorkshire, um, uh, in, in a town that was quite poor uh, and, and you know, there weren't that many um, kids that were expected to go to university. So she actually ended up going to university much later in life and it, it was kind of a big struggle to get a degree. So she, I think, always valued education. So having a kid getting an offer from Cambridge was, yeah, that's brilliant wow so so much had happened in your life before Cambridge and you know I, I, I thought about this a lot and I don't know if I have an answer but you know when when we meet someone you know when I first met you it's like oh president of the Cambridge Union and the the, the their impressions oh well his life has been perfect he's had things all figured out and I think as I grew up as well and as you achieve things like for me in basketball and music and grades getting into Cambridge getting an internship other people just and it's not their fault but they 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 they, they just see you in a light that is totally not how we see ourselves because mm. we actually know the struggles that we've had mm. the insecurities the doubts our weaknesses mm. um so it's it's so interesting to hear that before um the, the Freddy that I met, there was this holistic Freddy that had gone through so much and it's very inspiring. I'm, I'm still very impressed, you know, when you were 11 getting up and, and reading. I mean, that, that, that's super impressive and taking that bold decision to to self-study and to um, be self-disciplined and I'm, I'm so happy that it's paid off. But moving on to Cambridge, which is a totally different bubble one <laughs> it definitely is a bubble yeah 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 so my my understanding of your time at Cambridge is you were kind of involved in a bit of drama to start with mm. and then progressively got more involved in like the political side of mm. things so the um Lib Dems mm. um what was that cooler cooler yes yeah, yeah. Gosh, I've been out for eight weeks I've already forgotten <laughs> <laughs> that's okay I feel like I've forgotten my entire time at Cambridge <laughs> it was a year ago now let's try and rediscover it okay <laughs> but yeah um, you you were quite active in Kulu and obviously the union as treasurer and then president but yeah what what were you involved in at Cambridge oh, oh cheese and wine you were you founded the Robinson Cheese and Wine Society as well. Yeah, I um, <laughs> uh, I say because um, I'm I feel I'm always s- slightly slightly embarrassed in everyday conversation to bring up the union. So I say that that's my proudest achievement at, at Cambridge. <laughs> to some extent, it, uh, it is because it was something that I did in you know entirely with a friend, entirely from scratch. Whereas the union and drama is something that other people set up and you go and join and be a part of. You mean union drama or drama? drama? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of union drama, but um, I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that uh, that I didn't set up too much union drama. But I think you can, you can be the judge of that. Uh, no, d- drama and the union. You know, you, you, the union was a well-established organisation. D- drama, you had, you know, people directing and producing a play and you go on audition 
cheese and wine was just something that a friend and I thought would be a great thing to set up in college. And it actually ended up being quite popular and we never expected it to be. We just thought it would basically be, you know, a couple of friends sitting around trying different exciting cheeses. Um, but yeah, that was that was good. I think it was um, it was successful because we basically never expected it to be a success and we never took it very seriously. <laughs> and, and in Cambridge, there are lots of you know, wine societies run by fellows or students at you know, sort of older colleges and the wine society is as old as the college or whatever. And Robinson is a new college and it never had anything like that. And we just thought, oh, well, it'd be fun to, to bring some nice tasting things, but at ridiculously low price. So we had six pound entry for cheese and wine tickets and we had about five or six rounds of cheese and wine in an evening and um, we knew nothing about either of those but we went to some quite nice shops in Cambridge and we kind of got the cheese merchants and the wine merchants to educate us and mm. and then we uh, we relayed that and, and had fun and I think people enjoyed it because it was kind of a, a bit quirky and kind of not very pretentious but trying to be pretentious. Mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind but um, I would love to just read out the advice you gave me in your very first message when I asked you about, I think I asked you, um, would you please be able to share some tips on making the most of my time in Cambridge? And you were ridiculously generous. And um, yeah, I, I thought it, it's really good advice. And I, I will read it out in full if you don't mind. Not at all. But you wrote, hi, David. Thanks for your message. Great to connect. Oh, such LinkedIn language. <laughs> oh, I know. It's cringe, isn't it? I'm so sorry. Huge congratulations on securing your place at Queer. I'm delighted to hear that you've joined the union already. Oh, no. <laughs> I hope this will be money very well spent. In spite of the pandemic, we've still got lots of very exciting speakers events lined up for this year, so do make the most of it and watch this space. What a question. I'm always tentative to give advice about Cambridge because it very much depends on what you want to get out of your time here. As a general rule, I would say be willing to put yourself out there and try new things. The more you do this, the more you'll realise what you enjoy and what you want to strive for. There are so many societies to get involved with, which you can try out during the virtual Freshers Week. Don't be afraid to take a few more risks than you might have done at school. You've got the luxury of living without conditional offers and be on and or exams, at least for a bit. So you can afford to experiment intellectually and spend time developing yourself should you wish. I'll say take this opportunity. This is a time to try out new styles of working as much as it is to take up new hobbies. Above all, remember to have fun. Doubtless, one of the best things I've gained in my two years here are some fantastic friends and memories. I hope this will be one of the main things which stays with me after I leave. Do let me know if you have any other specific questions, either about the Union or Cambridge in general. Otherwise, enjoy your summer, and I look forward to maybe seeing you in the Union in October. Well, so much, Freddie, has happened since then. This was August 2020. You've had your term of presidency. We've met in person. We've worked together. You've graduated. You've done a year out of Cambridge. When you hear back to this message... What's your reaction at the moment? Well, f firstly, I thought, phew, because um, <laughs> the, the idea that someone would drag up a message that I wrote two years ago <laughs> like, completely alarms me because I, uh, I, 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 I never think about my messages in that long term away. But that sounded fine, so I'm quite well glad that I, um, that I spent the time to write that. Um, I, yes, I, I think I still feel those things very strongly. Um, I, I suddenly got to Cambridge and realised, oh God, I, I sort of made it. I sort of did the thing that I spent quite a lot of time trying to achieve. And, I, you know, I didn't until my second or third year have exams that were going to go on my transcript and follow me for life. And that was the sort of first time in three, four years when that wasn't the case. And so it was very liberating, actually. Um, and I also got to somewhere where I knew I would never be the best academically. And that was also liberating, knowing that you didn't have to be in the top you know, 5%, you know, which you might have to be at school in order to get a shot at Oxbridge. Hmm. So I, I kind of, yeah, threw myself into lots of different things and I really enjoyed that. And so I suppose I wrote this 
this must have been at the beginning of my third year, second year, yeah, third, third year. Third, yeah. um, and I, I suppose I'd look back at that experience and thought, wow, that was great fun. Um, mm. It's it's rare these moments that you can, y- you have the space to just pursue whatever you're interested in. Mm. And I suppose that was what I was trying to convey. And Cambridge is fantastic because there are so many opportunities to do that within such a small time frame and a you know, small geographical place, you can access so much. Um, I hope that, that, that maybe you felt the same and, and, uh, and were able to do that. I, I definitely get the sense that you have made the most of your time, a far better use of your time than, than me, actually. I'm constantly in awe that you seem to make the most of every waking second. <laughs> no, I think we'll try our best. And I think we both appreciate what a, great opportunity it is to be in a bubble like Cambridge where you're living with people who are who have very diverse interests but the 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 one thing that they share is their passion for whatever they do you know they they want to be the best they Mm. they 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 they, they don't really settle and they're always looking to learn more Mm. I think in it when, when you're in there you don't perhaps appreciate as much of how much you're developing and changing but now that I've been in London and away for eight weeks, I realise what a unique time Cambridge has been. And certainly, mm. as I go back for my final year, mm. I'll be appreciating and trying to treasure those interactions and moments. Mm. But were there one or two people throughout your time at Cambridge who you were either like in awe of their personality, achievements, abilities, and who just really... Sh- shaped you in ways that you just wouldn't have previously imagined if that mm. makes sense. Um yeah. So so many so many people. Um I mean one of the things that was great about Cambridge is that I felt I I made lots of friends which I hope I'll have for for life and at school I had a really solid group of friends but it wasn't a massive group. And at Cambridge I met so many people who I found really interesting and wanted to keep in touch with and I suppose I was also doing a lot, so I'd see people quite regularly. And that's the beauty of Cambridge is a small city, you're constantly bumping into people, so it's easier to keep in touch. In terms of people that were particularly inspiring, I had a great group of friends at college who I think collectively inspired me. They really had their lives together. Um, they were very organised. And, and I, I think that was one of the great things about Cambridge, it did make me a little bit more organised. Um, they were also just very considerate friends um, and I feel really taught me to um, think consciously about doing things for people and making sure that you organise events that are inclusive and that everyone feels engaged with and keeping up the friendship. So I felt inspired by a really solid group of friends at college um, who I think were all relatively friendly with other people in college as well. So I met through them a lot of people. Mm. Um, I met um, friends, Gabriel and Becky, um, mm. through um, the Lib Dems, and then Gabriel was involved in the union as well. Um, and they they taught me a lot. They were just both very competent. And so I feel I owe a lot of skills I've acquired. Simple things like cooking. I was a terrible cook, but they used to um, host very nice um, dinners and um, I remember the first time I tried to cook for them I tried risotto and um, I basically charred the risotto I, I didn't appreciate that risotto needed water or moisture so um, so it became kind of like these bullet these bullets in, in a pan um, <clears throat> but and they, they, they were very kind <laughs> and patient with me and then taught me that evening how, how you needed to cook risotto and we tried again and etc um, Gabriel also had lots of leadership roles in Cambridge. I think was very good at um, managing people. Um, so I learned a lot from him in that respect. And also uh, academically, I mean, he was, he was very, he was a um, history student like me. the best speakers I have. Ever. Yeah, yeah. He's very charismatic, very um, thought-provoking speaker, I think. Um, he's got a, a, an amazing ability to to take a lot of information and distill it into a couple of very simple concepts and to really make his own impact on the, or imprint on the information that he um, 
has absorbed. And I think a lot of very successful people in Cambridge, myself included, are successful because they pick up ideas that they've read or they've heard from other people. And you sort of amalgamate them into this kind of group of things that they will call their views. But it felt like Gabriel really had a slightly unique way of looking at the world. Um, and uh, it's something that I feel like a way of thinking that I have kind of adopted in many different ways. I mean, we have a lot of fierce disagreements as well. Mm. Um, he was also really good at his subject, mm. I think, because he thought quite uniquely about history. Mm. And he was really good at getting to the point very quickly and developing a strong argument. And so he um, was applying actually for um, masters and then PhD mm. um, places mm. when I knew him so part of being a PhD student is you might do a bit of tutoring on the side so he was very keen to kind of tutor me a bit um so we had a few discussions about history and I found that yeah very useful so yeah I, there are loads of people I mean I feel this is uh, a terribly inexhaustive list and I, I I I hope that almost none of my friends are listening to this because <laughs> there are so many people that have um influenced me in profound ways at Cambridge and I think it's exactly what you say you might. So there, there were people at Cambridge that actually weren't that excited about their subject, but they were passionate about something. There was sort of, everybody had their own um, geeky quirk, their own thing that they really wanted to focus on. Mm. And it's just fantastic to be in that environment where you can learn so much from different people and their different interests. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to avoid the union but um, I feel like it is the elephant in the room. I, I said, I said to, uh, don't focus too much on the union. Well, I'm very happy to talk about the union. I, I, I really enjoyed it. But I, 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 all, all I was saying is that, um, that um, I hope it's not all that I'm remembered for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think now's a, probably a good time just because we've got all that context. And I think, mm. that, I think a, a lot of the union things that we'll share will make a lot of sense with that kind of longer arc of trajectory in mind but both of us obviously gone quite deep in that kind of environment you much deeper than me but <laughs> but um I'm, I'm not necessarily sure deeper just uh <laughs> different higher, direction higher. well no I'm not really sure about that either um I guess like one thing for me that I've I think overall I'm incredibly appreciative of my time with the union and you know it, it's just things like like inviting speakers like it's doing the grunt work like searching up speakers contacts um emailing chasing up emails hopping on a zoom calling and then collaborating within the committee to manage workload um you know i i you know the google sheets google form just like very basic skills but beyond that there were also other elements like um campaigning or just understanding understanding like thinking always thinking about how to improve an organization mm. you know elections come around every term mm. and it's almost like the expectation that every term is like whoa this is going to be a new society we're mm -hmm. going to do this do that the manifestos come out the pleasures come out and then there are endorsements which at the time were quite new to me mm. like oh you know you, you have to contact people to get their backing or their support and no one really knows how much endorsements actually actually mean. Mm. Um, I think I also appreciate just the, obviously, the debates and the speakers and the conversations that come from it and seeing an event from the invite stage into fruition and you've got, like, the different departments, like, you know, events management who are doing the logistics, you've got the publicity who are um, sharing you know, the content to the wider audience, mm. you have the membership drive of how do you recruit new people mm. in, photography, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it was a very, actually, complex organisation for for a group of students mm. to run, in retrospect. Yeah. Sort of insane, sort of bonkers, actually. But, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Like, when you're in it, you think it's normal. Mm. But I don't think many uni students actually have that kind of exposure to... The running like mm. we, even weekly meetings are having agenda and minutes like it I, I i wasn't used to that and i i had leadership experiences in high school yeah i was sitting in board meetings yeah and, yeah yeah but mm. um it, it, it was incredible and i, I just want to maybe ask you kind of how 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 did you find 
the union and it's a very broad question mm. intentionally so just to give you a mm. chance to add your own flair I, firstly i completely agree with you it is a really unique place and um weird and wonderful and it, and it is sort of bonkers uh, what the union gets up to i think it's a quirk of being linked to cambridge and having an old history but if you think you know at the age of like 19 20 21 22 you can be you know you may as as one of my predecessors did bill gates and organizing a, a you know a, a talk with him or um you know as you did and, and others were involved with as well robert de niro yeah. it, it i mean there aren't many organizations you can get involved with at that age with such a kind of name pull or whatever it is at the union just draws a lot of really interesting people together. I love the fact that debates are at the union's core as well, because I do think there are some really thought-provoking discussions that happen in the chamber. Um, I suppose I always believe that that, that that should be the centre of the union. Um, I mean, fundamentally, it's a, a place for discussion and uh, debate, the kind of free exchange of ideas, to get involved with that so early in life is 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 amazing and and it's also i mean you're thrust i mean it's a it's a it's a charity as a student you know <laughs> barely turning twenty twenty two i was um a trustee of the charity i was looking over kind of um <clears throat> redevelopment plans and budgets that were you know in the millions of pounds it's an insane thing to be in, involved in I, I don't think I fully processed mm. that and, and how useful an experience it was I think it's given me a lot and it's something I'm sure that you you know bring up in interviews if you're ever doing anything in related to the world of work um, it gives you so much it gives you kind of both the um, just the amazing life experience like you interviewing Joe Wicks <laughs> just an extremely interesting anecdote an extremely fulfilling thing to do but also it forces you to develop a lot of organizational skills as well um which i think have probably stood me in relatively good stead mm -hmm. absolutely and well thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview joe wicks but yeah no indeed and it's also like the public scrutiny mm. like I, I i i certainly didn't realize perhaps until second year that the fact that I was in the union means that other people would see me in a particular way whether mm. fair or not mm -hmm. and you know for me I probably came in being quite naive because I'm you know from Australia I didn't really know the British kind of culture uh, or the politics like I remember in the Lent debate last year I was sitting next to Jacob Rees-Mogg <laughs> and I, I, I had no idea who he was and it seemed to me that everyone on the chamber were just taking photos of me and I became quite self-conscious. Am I dressing differently? Do I have something? Like, is it my hair? Is it my face? Yeah. And afterwards I was on like everyone's Instagram story because Jacob Reese mogg was there. Um, but I, I didn't know who he was, which was a really interesting, like for me to go in and like the entire time I was trying to figure out my place yeah. and the mm. perceptions of the union. Mm. And there are so much, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if controversy is the right word, mm. but so much scrutiny at least, mm. and everyone seems to have their own say about it. And for you as president, did you feel like the publicity side of things were easy to manage or did you learn much from it? And, mm. Yeah. Uh, definitely not um, easy. And I think you're constantly aware that you're inhabiting a space that has a lot of attention and and they're also uh, it's a space where there are a lot of people that impose their own views mm. on the union a lot of people that feel quite hostile towards it i feel we had this sort of paradoxical position where everyone would tell you in cambridge that the union wasn't relevant it was kind of an old institution it was a bit old-fashioned um it did things which didn't really resonate with students it felt out of touch etc and uh, when I joined, actually, I feel it ch changed quite a lot, maybe particularly by your kind of second term in second year in Cambridge. When I joined, um, 
I think uh, there were a number of uncontested positions. Uh, they were struggling a little bit in certain departments for getting um, applicants. Mm. And I think that's how I, I ended up getting involved, um, uh, by, by maybe by a bit of a fluke. Um, so we had this kind of sense that maybe wasn't as relevant as it used to be. But then <clears throat> suddenly also became extremely controversial and everybody... Um, <laughs> at the same time as people saying it was irrelevant, everybody got extremely exercised when the union would invite somebody that they disagreed with, which I think really proved the fact that we were still relevant. Um, and, and it's amazing that I mean, the Cambridge Union isn't just, isn't just scrutinised in the Cambridge student press, but in the national press. And, you know, we, we know people who have seen the, the sort of bitter end of that. And uh, occasionally we've seen, you know, the good end of that as well, when, you know, something that an interesting speaker has said at the union gets quoted in a national newspaper. Um, in terms of managing that, um, I think my line was always that, um, without wanting to get to kind of too heady on the politics of this, uh, the commitment to free speech is absolutely right, but that it's a two-way street and that very often in public discourse now, we have um, what feels like a kind of slight fragmentation of public debate where you get some really influential speakers, but they're very often preaching to the converted. You see this in the States with you know, <clears throat> a news channel that's kind of always seems to be on you know the centre or the left and then a news channel that's on the right. And it feels like the people interviewing them are kind of adherence of their worldview um and 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 in the uk we you know we have organizations like uh, lbc which are relatively centrist uh um <clears throat> and have quite a kind of urban uh middle class um kind of listenership uh, and then we have other uh programs as well which which draw in different um viewers it feels like everyone i, I think social media does this as well and that because of the way the algorithms work, you're constantly being fed that echo chamber of, yeah, things that you... corroborate your own views, yeah. Um, and so, for me, I thought the union was quite special in that it was still doing a very old-fashioned head-to-head with people on completely different sides of the argument. So I suppose my way of navigating the controversy was always to try and match speakers up with, uh, you know, on what, you know, if you had a particularly vocal proponent of something on one side, you you'd try and get adequate scrutiny by another heavyweight mm. representing the other side of the argument um yeah so I, that that was that was i mean i didn't always get it right and, you know we had plenty of um criticisms for inviting certain speakers um but i hope that because i tried to make the focus on debate and discussion it meant that we would never try to mm. give a, a sort of um mm. unquestioning platform to people of any one particular opinion totally and uh, again it's back to that point where these are complex complex controversial things that we as students who are still you know we're we're, we're still forming our views and but we also at the same time need to almost have it figured out and need to be able to communicate and stand by our view which is yeah i, I think it's such a formative thing i mean I, I certainly don't regret joining the union and again I, I'm very grateful for everyone who I've met and I, I actually do genuinely think quite highly of the people I've worked with and you know I don't agree with everyone's policies or their their, 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 their way of seeing the world all the time but mm. I do think at their core these are hard-working ambitious students who are trying to learn and trying to make a difference in mm. that sense and but I guess a lot of people, one of the main challenges of the union is just the political side of things and you know when when elections are uncontested it's easy you know everyone's backing you but when they are contested and people have to take sides and you know there, there's that kind of tension of i i think by far the most difficult part i found was rumors where yeah. people would just like at times i would walk in and I would hear from other people, oh, I heard you said that or did this. Mm. I'm like, oh, when, when did that happen? Mm. And things just spread. And I think with a bit of time out, I now realise that I don't know what I know about other people's mm. views because even 
what I think other people have said, I've not heard it directly from a particular mm. person and you don't know how things have changed along the way, like Chinese whispers. Yeah. Um, so for someone who is entering the uni now, like perhaps new fresh years and perhaps with ambitions, which is not a bad thing. Like I don't think there's anything wrong with going in and wanting to do, do your best and getting on standing committee. And, Absolutely. Um, for them, what advice would you give in terms of navigating the political and social dimensions of it the politics side mm. um i'd say it's probably useful to go in with a sense of your own self and your own ideas and i think often things are miscommunicated when people feel they don't really know you mm. and in a way it sounds paradoxical but in a way trying to ignore the mm. kind of uh <clears throat> rumors heavy um, kind of gossipy side of the union is most healthy um, because I think people and I definitely you know you fall into a trap where you think oh god I've got to make sure that I'm pleasing this group of people and um, uh, I, I, I respect them and I, I need their support in order to get on I think uh, it sounds a bit cliche but if you if you can try and have a sense of self and and and, uh, and and let that guide you and the things that you're interested in. Mm. Um, I mean, in a, in a way, I think it's probably similar to my... I mean, the union is is, is inherently political, um, mm. not because it necessarily needs to always do political things or put on a political event, but we have elections. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so there's going to, you know, there's going to be a bit of spin, there's going to be trying to get people on side, there's, you know, going to be a bit of back, backstabbing as well. Um but if you can, I don't know, I feel it's a problem that we face in politics at the moment a lot. It's not just the union. It's no, 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 absolutely. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's the world. Yeah. In, in the way that, that it feels like, I, I don't know why this is. I don't know whether it's got something to do with the way social media operates. But it feels like people are constantly trying to um, appease groups and follow public opinion. I get that in the union as well. Um, but actually, I find the most successful people I've witnessed in the union have tried to shape people's views. They've they've not tried to just appease groups or follow, you know, an opinion or a trend. It, it, it's actually standing up and saying, this is what I stand for and mm. I disagree with you here. And that kind of integrity, I think, if nothing else, is the sort of person that I think ought to do well in the union. That's great. That's great, um, Freddie. What what's next for you? Well, um, I've just finished my law conversion, uh, which I greatly enjoyed. Um, it was a bit of a risk because I took a training contract with a solicitor's firm, um, not having really studied much or any law. Uh, I thought I had this kind of instinctive sense that it would be something that I would enjoy. It felt like a bit of a merger of my different interests, mm. and. Um, yeah, I, 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 thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoy learning about the law. So next year I will be doing the legal practice course, which is a bit more mm. procedural. Um, it's learning the kind of nuts and bolts of how, how to um, draw up uh, contracts, how to write emails to clients, uh, how to uh, present yourself in a way that's suitable in a legal environment. Mm. Um, and then after that, in September 2023, I start in the, in the big wide world. And I'm excited about it and extremely nervous about it as well. <laughs> but it sounds like um, you've got all the competencies or the attitude to navigate the challenges ahead. And and you ha- have you done a podcast like this before? How have you found it so far? Um, I haven't. Um, it's great. It's very self-indulgent. <laughs> I, I don't think... I, I, I mean, I, I'm ashamed to say I do quite enjoy... Like, sort of talking about myself but I don't think I've ever done it at this length before um, and it's it's lovely to have someone who's so interested I mean I'm constantly dying to to do what, what I think you and I do in, in, in normal conversations friends and say well what do you think about this David and I'm I'm um, I, I'm I'm sort of slightly uncomfortable constantly talking about myself but it's also great because it's a wonderful opportunity for int- introspection and you've asked me a lot of questions I've not really fully thought about it's also great to be taken through my life chronologically 
and to think about connections between things I did as a kid and things that I'm doing now or, or did at university and to see trends and also turning points. It's, um, yeah, it's a great opportunity. I've really enjoyed it and I, I, again, really appreciate your honesty in this chat but also just for how you have shaped my time at university and how I interact and do things and so many of the opportunities that I have now wouldn't have come about without you going above and beyond and showing kindness and even just seeing things like, as I mentioned in my campaign, of you checking in um, when I was really struggling in Australia. And it's very much, I think, about the stage of life that we're in. Like, right now, if someone was checking in on me, like, I'm feeling fine, so I wouldn't necessarily feel as much of it. Like, it, mm. it's still important, mm. but at that point, you know, all that message just meant everything like yeah. you just needed someone to say well i'm here for a chat if you want or i yeah. can introduce you to the the, the 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 student union to talk about your um intermission thoughts and all that kind of stuff like, it was just super helpful but um yeah super super great discussion and i definitely hope we can stay in touch yeah absolutely absolutely i know um you 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 said that um you didn't want me to um, interview you and you didn't feel ready to be interviewed. <laughs> but can, can we end? Can I ask you uh, a question? Sure, of course. Uh, I mean, wh- what, you, you are working very hard uh, the last couple of months doing an internship um, and you're spending your free weekends when the weather is lovely and sunny outside interviewing um, people that you have met in the UK. Um, why on earth are you doing it? It's a wonderful thing to do. And it feels like a great luxury for me. But what is it that's that's motivating you to do this? Mm. It's a really, really good question. And I think it comes down to kind of three things. Um, the first one is I really enjoy. Um, the, the superficial first answer is I really enjoy um, speaking to people and listening to their stories. And and I'm, yeah, I, I just find this is when I'm in flow. I feel like I'm concentrated um, the fact that I'm stuttering and the fact that I'm saying my ums suggests that I'm thinking. So that's the superficial, I guess, first Good thing. sign, yes. Um, the second thing is I think I'm obsessed with the idea of memory collection. Mm. Um, part of that may be growing up, I have moved around, you know, in China, Australia, and now coming to the UK, had wonderful wonderful memories you know with family at home different people um mum and dad were good role models um in sport in basketball I had great seasons great matches music performances service learning all that kind of stuff so I'm always thinking like how do I actually capture like my my development and Mm. how I've changed and I think podcast is a one way of you know noting down my current thoughts at this time and I can look back on it down the track and Mm. certainly for the guests I hope that this for them would be a piece of recording that they can look back upon with great meaning Mm. and satisfaction and I guess another aspect of memory is obviously my mum having passed away and when I was 12 Mm. I I, I sometimes wish that I could I I could get to know her a bit better Mm. and you know if only she had recordings like that and Mm. yeah yes I think that's the second reason, and I guess the third main reason might be that I feel like I still have a lot of questions about myself. I'm still trying to find my place in the world, who I am, what I want to stand for, mm. and I feel like one of the best ways to do this is to hear from other people about how they have done it, and I certainly want to be someone who is open to... Um, understanding other people and the wider community so they're probably the three reasons that come to mind at this point it's very interesting reasons i i'm uh, corroborated in my view that you would uh, be a great guest on your own show <laughs> um that was i think very insightful and interesting um i, I suppose i mean it's I, I have a great admiration for what you're doing and wish that i had the the courage and the tenacity to actually do this every 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 weekend and interview someone new <laughs> Um, I suppose maybe, I mean, one of the reasons we're good friends is I say, I think we're both very interested in, it sounds like a very bland thing to say, but very interested in people and where they've come from. And I wonder whether some of that comes from being, I, mean, I, I haven't moved nearly as far as you have, um, but I, you know, I did, 
I've had a few moments in my life where I've moved from a completely different part of the country and experienced something very new. And I feel that sense of otherness gives a bit of intrigue and you I think you appreciate much more how people have shaped your life because your life changes in, in, in slightly more noticeable and profound ways. Yeah, wouldn't prefer any other way. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, Freddie. Oh, any final comments? Because um, this is about giving you a legacy worth the interview, but any other final comments you want to share? Uh, no, uh, other than uh, thank you very much again for the coffee um, and for a, a wonderful hour or so of conversation.